My name's Tim Gardner. I'm a senior fellow at an organization called the Health Foundation based in London. Um, I've been there about two years. Before that, I spent 10 years on and off working on health policy at the UK Department of Health. So whether that makes me a poacher turned gamekeeper or a gamekeeper turned poacher, I haven't quite worked out yet. Um, right. So just a, a little bit about the Health Foundation before I, I get into to the substance of this. Um, so we are uh, not part of, of the UK government or part of the UK health system at all. We're an independent charitable foundation. We're one of the biggest in the UK. We were set up and are funded through an endowment that was made as the biggest ever charitable donation in the history of the United Kingdom. Um, and that allows us to self-fund what we do, which is our mission to improve the quality of health and health care in the, in the UK. Um, we effectively live off the interest of our endowment, and that means we spend roughly the equivalent of about 50 million Canadian dollars every year funding frontline service improvement projects, funding research, uh, professional development for individuals working in health and health care. And we also do a lot of policy and economic analysis. Um, we're, I think, probably unique in terms of healthcare in the UK and being able to combine learning from what works at the front line with effective policy making and trying to combine those two things. Um, so as, as John mentioned, I'm, I've come here to talk about a bit of work that we did and published last year. Uh, it's a report called Clear Road Ahead. Um, I only have one copy with me if anyone wants to take it so I don't have to take it back on the plane with me. Um, oh, sorry, I think it's gone. Um, but there, there's a link in the, in, the, in the slide which I'd be very happy to share. Um, this was a piece of work which is uh, fully available on our website which was effectively reviewing the national quality strategy within the English National Health Service um, or, or possibly what we felt at the time was a lack of one. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that and there are some concepts that may be relevant and some learning that may be relevant to other systems as well. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to do a very quick piece of scene setting. Uh, so as many of you will know, the UK health system is largely based around our National Health Service, which was founded in 1948 to offer universal access to a comprehensive range of healthcare services. Uh, the vast majority of NHS funded services are free at point of use, uh, with access based on need rather than ability to pay. And funding is primarily through uh, general taxation uh, and provision uh, is, is very much uh, publicly owned, uh, especially by comparison to other countries. Uh, it, it's worth being clear that I'm talking about England, I'm not talking about the UK. So the UK instituted a new policy of devolution uh, from 1999 onwards, and what this means is that health policy is a devolved matter. So England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland each have their own national health service, um, funded from UK-level taxes, um, based around the same principles I've just talked through, um, but organized and managed very differently with their own priorities, with their own sets of policy makers. Um, and since 1999, those, those four health services have diverged quite substantially. Um, although some of the other analysis that we did a couple of years ago suggests that their performance is now converging, which is quite interesting. Um, a quick reflection on, on England and the NHS in England. England, as, as, as you probably know, is the largest component of the United Kingdom. We have a, a population of over 50 million. Um, to put it bluntly, we're, England is the healthiest and wealthiest part of, of the UK. And because funding is allocated based on population needs, uh, there's a lower per head level of spending than in, in the other three countries. Uh, England's also the only part of the UK where the health service has a purchase provider split, where there has been, certainly over the last 20, 30 years, more of an emphasis on using choice and competition to try and drive improvements in performance and quality, uh, certainly than in Scotland and Wales, which are rather more collaborative and don't have that, that same structure. England's also got a much greater plurality of provision. 
um, and more NHS-funded care is provided by non-NHS providers. Uh, that's something that's increased in recent years, uh, albeit still at relatively low levels um, that are way out of proportion with the controversy that that has, has generated in some quarters. We use a range of different payment mechanisms uh, depending on whether we're looking at primary care, which uses weighted capitation in, in many ways, uh, secondary care, which is largely activity-based funding, uh, whereas mental health and community services are largely done on block contract. And there are, there's a plethora of financial incentive arrangements and pay for performance schemes around and cutting across all of these things. Uh, public health and social care is provided by local government uh, and the latter of which of, of those is, is based on, is, is not covered under the general health care offer. So it's based on needs and means rather than just um, needs as, as the NHS is. Uh, which is again different in, very different in Northern Ireland which tries to integrate um, those two sets of services. There is a hugely long and complicated history of health reform in England, and I, I could probably spend 25 hours talking about it rather than 25 minutes. Uh, in fact, there, there's so much that we saw the need to pull together the history of reform, in some cases going back to back about 400 years, um, on a separate website, which I'll leave you to, to browse if you're interested. Um, the URL is just at the bottom of the slide. Um, but I think suffice to say, um, if you can, if there's, a, if there's a policy lever you can name, we've almost certainly tried it in England. Um, I think the only, the only exception to that I can think of is a long period of stability, um, <laughs> frankly. Uh, there are some themes around some of the, of, of, of the, the policy direction of travel, um, reducing the amount of top-down command and control that goes on in the health service. So trying to devolve power down to local level, and also trying to take the politics and the politicians um, out of the direct running of, of the health service as well. Um, both of which, as you might have inferred from the fact that they've been repeatedly tried, have not been unremittingly successful. But anyway, um, I think that one of the most notable of these was the set of reforms pursued under the new Labour government that was in power from 1997 to 2010. Um, so this um, is one of the most notable periods in, in recent NHS history. This was described in a 2003 report by one of my collaborators on, on the research that we did, uh, Professor Sheila Leatherman, who's a research professor at the Gilling School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina, as the world's most ambitious, comprehensive, systemic, and intentionally funded effort to create improvements in quality. Um, it's important to realize, I, you know, I've been talking to a couple of people this morning who, well, I think we were together, um, slightly regretting some of the short-termism that, that surrounds policy making. And it's important to be clear, this was not an exception. This, this was not a long-term, 13-year, 10-year plan. That, well, there was a 10-year plan, but it lasted about two years. Um, th this was a set of, neither was there a logical development or linear progression in terms of policy direction. There were starts and stops. Um, there were waves of reform. Initially, the, the diagnosis was that the NHS just simply needed more money and a bit of direction, and all would be fine. Um, then there was an appreciation, no, we needed not just more money, but greater levels of expectation um, and, and commitment and accountability, and then ever higher doses of reform and change and restructuring, um, which went on quite a lot during this period. Um, I think our, our, our first speaker today, Dr. Boussied, um did some of my job for me. I could say he stole some of my thunder, but fortunately, I think actually he... He, uh, he saved me some time. So from all of this, the reason why this is notable is that quality of care on a number of measures, a number of very important measures, got better. And it got better in some instances quite remarkably. So this is simply an illustration of cancer mortality, which improved quite a lot over that period. Um, and in fact, this is quite an old slide, but as you might guess from the trend of that graph, um, the target level, which is the one 
over on the far right was exceeded ahead of time. Um, waiting times to access elective care um, tumbled famously from over 18 months to less than 18 weeks and, and in many cases much shorter times. Uh, we went from a position where people died on waiting lists um, waiting to access care to people having to defer their appointments because they were being rushed into hospital too soon. Um, so it was quite remarkable. But there's a big question which was something that, that uh, Sheila Leatherman and, and her collaborator who were appointed as the as a, an independent evaluator of some of these reforms and produced a series of reports on them over the, the new Labour years. One of the questions they asked in their final report, which I've referenced on this slide, was quality got better, but was the improvement commensurate with the extra funding that was poured in? And when you compare some of the improvements that we made with performance over other, of other countries over time, in some cases the answer was possibly not quite as much as we, we would have expected. So again, this is cancer mortality. Um, the UK is the top line, so we make some quite big improvements, um, albeit from a fairly high base, so we should be improving quickly. Uh, the bottom line is Australia, which improved just as much, but from a, from a lower starting point, where improvement should logically be more difficult. So one of the big questions that was asked was, why not? And what could we do to, to improve it? And the answer that, that Leatherman and co. came to was, despite all of the extra money, all of the change and the restructuring and the reform, um, a lot of the, the theory of change had been that we could reform the system, the system would become self-improving, and we didn't have to worry about the outcomes and the outputs because... They, they would happen. And we didn't focus on actually achieving some of those, those quality outcomes that we, we actually really wanted. And so what they advocated in a 2008 report um, was that the NHS should develop a national quality program, um, which should have two over overriding objectives. One was to develop a very clear approach to setting and pursuing goals to improve the quality of care, to make better and realise better investments in improving quality, um, to make sure that we got best value for investment. Um, and the second one was to make much better use of the incredibly rich evidence base that, that we have in England, because we've tried to do so much. The evidence base isn't comprehensive, but it's, there's quite a lot of it. Um, and we actually need to do more, we need to get better at learning and, and refining what's there rather than throwing the baby out, out of the bathwater every three years, which is broadly what happened um, in many cases. That report was, was published in 2008 and it was incredibly conveniently timed because at that point the government had commissioned uh, a leading surgeon, uh, Aradazi, to lead a review of the NHS. So by this point... Uh, they made him a junior health minister in order to do that. By this point, with all of the change and the restructuring that had gone on, uh, clinical, the level of clinical engagement with improving the health service and, and reform was probably reaching an all-time low. It, what, what had started in 2000 as being a hugely enthused uh, body of professionals um, had, I think, been ground down by fairly top-down command and control, performance management tactics, lots of technocratic focus on things like payment systems, which didn't really seem to speak to what, what many clinicians were felt was important for them. And so the purpose of the what was called the NHS Next Stage Review was to try and, first and foremost, to re-engage some of that and, and try and find a way of, of, of getting the enthusiasm back. And that, this report came out about three months after the one I talked about in the previous slide. And it adopted whole, almost wholesale a num, uh, the, the proposals for a national quality programme. So some of the things included in the, the NHS Next Stage Review final report were having a, a clear national definition of quality, which had never existed in the NHS before. It also described a clear national framework with seven parts, which I'll come on to in a bit later, 
to try and use for aligning plans, actions, resources that were being taken at national level throughout the system in order to try and make quality the organising principle of the health service. And a new national quality board. So this was not a new organisation. This was a new group bringing together the governmental and non-governmental leaders of the health service at national level, um, if nothing else, to bang heads together a bit and make sure that they were all going in the same direction. Now, this report w wasn't perfect, and what followed it wasn't perfect either, but I think there is a genuine reflection in, a across many of the people I've spoken to who were around during this time that it did represent really substantial progress, and it did a lot of what it set out to do, uh, especially over the, the following two years. But, because there's always a but, um, we've had quite a busy few years since 2010. Um, we had a change of government, for one thing. We brought in new coalition government with big, new, ambitious public service reform agendas and a determination to move radically and quickly. I'm not going to go through all of this in, in, in intricate detail. Um, I very happily talk to people afterwards. Um, this start, what started out as being quite a logical progression, a relatively small set of discrete changes very quickly snowballed into, a, into an enormous piece of legislation. And what, in the words of the former chief executive of the NHS in England, um, was a, a change program so big you could see it from space. <laughs> in parallel to some of this, there had been some inquiries and investigations going on into a small number of very high profile and very serious failures in quality of care in NHS hospitals, primarily in Stafford Hospital in the West Midlands. And this, these, these two things came together. So the, the, the reformed system, just I think seven weeks before it, it came into effect, uh, the inquiry into Stafford Hospital and what had happened there reported with 290 recommendations for government on how to improve the system of regulation and oversight around NHS hospitals. Um, over the next couple of years that followed, we saw more change as the government published not one, not two, but I think ultimately four responses, separate responses, to these very high-profile investigations into failures in quality um, and responding to those 290 recommendations plus the others that were made by other recommendations, uh, other investigations. There was a plan produced by the health service itself for how it was going to cope with a big financial slowdown. And then latterly we've seen a push towards development of new models of, of delivering care, uh, sustainability and transformation plans which are trying to make sure that we, I think on one level are trying to really think about place-based care um, on the other hand, are also about containing spend and trying to get the most from, from a limited budget. So in many ways, we've come full circle from a, a series of reforms that were designed to strengthen competition and choice. We're now moving back towards more of a top-down, planned system. This is working. So where does this, all, the, all this leave the NHS? Well, when I got on my plane yesterday morning, all the newspaper headlines were full of NHS crisis stories um, as the NHS struggles to deal with winter. Um, those are a bit exaggerated. In fact, they're quite strongly exaggerated. But I think, looking at this fairly, where, where, this, leaves the, where this left the NHS in 2015, which is when we started our work, was caught between the continuing growth in demand that we're pretty much seeing in every developed country, um, but whilst only being halfway through the most financially austere decade in its history. Um, so funding is growing, but by substantially less than is, is likely to be needed. The government has set some very challenging objectives for the health service to maintain quality, balance the books, and transform incredibly ambitiously how care is delivered. There's been a really strong revival of command and control uh, from the centre with proliferation of top-down policy initiatives, which again I'll come on to a little bit later, and we've been left following the reform process with some very complicated new structures. Um, there's been a major shift in health service government, governance. So in 2010, 
Um, we had a Department of Health um, and a few other fairly small, quite tightly defined bodies that worked at arm's length to manage the NHS at national level. We've now got, excluding the Department of Health, um, at least six major national bodies. Um, we've got NHS England, which commissions primary care, specialised services, and oversees local commissioning groups. We've got a body called NHS Improvement, which oversees providers of secondary care and is also the competition authority. We've got an independent quality regulator called the Care Quality Commission. We've got the National, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. We've got Health, Health Education England, which commissions and oversees the quality of medical and, and other professional training. And we've got a new public health body, just to mention the big ones. Um, all of these organisations have some responsibility and input to improving quality, none of whom has a mandate to provide overall leadership and coherence. So, in terms of what we did, our research, our aim was really to try and understand and make sense of, of this emerging developing policy framework around, you know, based around quality. Uh, in the wake of some very substantial changes over a seven-year period. What we did, we spoke to over 100 people, um, some very senior people at working at national level from, we didn't speak to the Secretary of State, but we sat in his office and spoke to someone who was close enough to know his thoughts. We spoke to a lot of very senior clinical and managerial leaders. We spoke to lots of other experts and stakeholders, patient organisations and so on. We did a big review of the, the various organizational roles and responsibilities um, at different levels of the system. We mapped out, um, for the first time, the various policy initiatives um, announced in response to some of these high-profile failures of quality. Uh, and we looked at some of this very rich evidence base that I mentioned to try and work out what seems to be the best options for, for moving forward. Some of the concepts we used to try and make sense of, of this um, so one was, one was the Duran Trilogy, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, if you're not, this talks about three core functions in, 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 in any system for, for quality. Uh, planning, improvement, and control, with the idea being that you need all three functions and you need them to be in balance in order for continuous improvement to happen. And the way we, we try to apply this to a health system that deals with over 50 million people was by talking about planning as setting up the structures and the organizations, setting the priorities and the rules and parameters for how the system operates. Um, control being the regulatory and other almost quasi-regulatory mechanisms in the system, so performance management for hitting national targets would fall into this, this category. Um, and then also critically improvement, so providing some of the hands-on practical support that people need to help them get better. Now, quite often when I talk about improvement coming from the Health Foundation, we've got a very strong background in quality improvement and helping to train up people in, in using quality improvement. So that quite often people think, say, well, you, by improvement, do you mean quality improvement? And, and I, I do, but I mean more than that as well. So I see this at, as operating at three, three levels, effectively. So one is the tools and techniques of quality improvement, which are inc obviously incredibly important but also around capability to make change and improvement happen, which is partly about building capability and expertise and quality improvement, but it's more. It's about having analytical skills, change management skills, good operational management, investing in leadership and leaders, um, and, and, putting, uh, and, and also analyti analytics, if I haven't mentioned that before already. Importantly, there's also, in a system this big, a much bigger thing, which I think we're still trying to come to grips with about how you do it and how you do it well, which is around creating an, an enabling and supportive environment to help these processes unfold and to help build this capacity. Um, I think what we've, we've learnt, it wasn't a difficult lesson to learn, is that because we've got such a top-down system, it's very easy for well-intentioned national efforts to, try, to actually squeeze out and, and, and crowd out some very other, otherwise very good local initiatives and local efforts to improve quality. Um, I, I 
I know I have a colleague who's very fond of uh, talking about the Secretary of State for Health as, a, as an office, not, a, an individ, not the current individual, um, as being a bit of a Godzilla. So in the Japanese Godzilla films, Godzilla is defending Tokyo, but he, he's generally trying to do good, if I remember rightly from watching them. Um, but he still stomps on a few skyscrapers anyway while he's doing it. Um, so this, this was quite helpful in trying to understand and characterize the, the current situation in terms of where the balance of, of power is in the system. Another, another framework that, that we used, and this was really helpful in terms of mapping out some of those organizational roles and responsibilities. So this is a thing called the NHS Quality Framework. This was originally devised in 2008 in Aradazi's review. Um, we it, it was, it's been used by the NHS ever since. Um, we took it, we adapted it slightly, and just before Christmas, the NHS published a national policy document where they adopted our revised version, which is, um, which is very encouraging. But the idea is that this helps to categorize and organize some of the key functions around quality that ha might happen at different levels of the system. So setting a clear direction and a coherent set of priorities, uh, bringing clarity to quality through having clear national standards and expectations, um, how you measure and report quality and how and to whom is quite important, how you recognize and reward good quality care, whether that's financial, through financial means or otherwise, um, how you safeguard quality through, through good regulatory systems and backstops, how you build that capability that's, that I, I talked about earlier, and then how you stay ahead through innovation and continuous improvement. And this really helped to identify some of the gaps, uh, some of the duplication that was happening with all of these new national bodies, and some of the inconsistency of approach. Uh, likewise, we also looked at, at, at this model, which is trying to describe very broadly what should happen at what level of the system, to try and get where the balance of power was in relation to national, regional, and local um, functions. And I think we identified overwhelmingly that most of them were at the top. Um, we also looked very, we spent a long time looking at uh, the, the impact of different policy levers. This is drawn from some earlier work that we did, which basically draw, says you can categorize policy levers in health into three basic types. The first is the type one, where you basically prod organizations, providers of care from the outside through targets, through performance management, inspection, payment mechanisms. The second is more through proactive support, so hands-on practical support to get better and improve how you go about doing things. And then the third is, is actually trying to affect the people who work in our healthcare system and the people who use it. Uh, and what we identified from this earlier piece of work is that we've got a really strong emphasis on these type one prod levers and we've underused the other two. And with, with this piece of research we published last year, we, we wanted to take this a bit further. So we, we took this and we turned it into a taxonomy um, of all of the different policy levers we, we thought had been used within England to try and improve health system performance. Um, unfortunately, this, because we've done so much, is also so big that you could see it from space. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see it on a single slide. Um, this is a quick summary of it. We divided it into six categories. We distinguished between those that were focused around people, patients, public, the public, the workforce, and versus those that were focused on systems and the organizations that operate within them. Um, we developed this, this taxonomy, which is very detailed, specifically around what had gone on in England. And then we reviewed the evidence base, looking specifically at actual initiatives that had been tried and tested within England to really try and understand what seemed to work within that specific context. So in terms of overall findings, what we concluded. Well, funnily enough, no one we spoke to said quality is not a priority. Everyone said quality is a priority. But the means to implement it and actually improve and make progress against quality objectives was weak. We found an imbalance in some of those, in the Duran core functions that I talked about. So control had been strengthened notably in the wake of some of these quality failures um, as, as our politicians 
understandably felt the need to be doing something and also to be seen to be doing something. But while control had been heavily strengthened, planning and particularly improvement were now, by contrast, underdeveloped quite substantially and, and, and the system was effectively out of balance. Um, we diagnose an incredibly complicated system architecture um, with lots of overlapping roles and responsibilities, lots of inconsistency of approach, no or very little coordination and alignment of objectives, with huge gaps in national leadership. No one was in charge. We identified a huge number of competing priorities. There was no single list for a person working in a, an NHS provider or commissioner of services who was thinking, what are the national must-dos? You know, what have I got to contribute towards these? There was no one list. There were multiple competing sets of lists, which wasn't hugely helpful. The same, or there was a similar point around the number of policy initiatives. We didn't do a, anything like a comprehensive count-up. We looked at what had been in the responses to some of these high-profile quality, uh, to the high-profile failures of quality. We look, only looked over three and a half years. We counted 179 in three and a half years. When we looked and revised that only to things following the Stafford inquiry, it added up to more than one a week. I had a conversation with a former colleague at the Department of Health who worked, worked on this at the time and uh, over the phone and I mentioned this figure and he said, no, 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 come on, that, that's very funny, what's the real figure? It's 179. Um, even, even the people at the Department of Health couldn't quite get their heads around it. So it, it was an enormous amount for people to get to grips with at local level. Um, a hugely unfocused approach to, to building capability. Lots of focus around some specific national programs, so support and help for people participating in the development of new models of care, but not outside of those immediate priorities. Very much a focus on the short term, rather less on building up capability for the medium and longer term. Um, plus a couple of other points around inconsistency in local accountability and asymmetry in measurement and, and quality reporting. Um, we also found that for a system that is trying to get the biggest quality bang out of its increasingly finite buck, um, there's a very simplistic assumption that better quality will cost less. In many cases, or in some cases, better quality will cost less. Um, in other cases, better quality, low cost, will require investment, financial investment, and time. Uh, in, in some instances, it will require one part of the system to invest, while another will reap the rewards in terms of reduced costs. And did we really have the right financial instruments set up to, uh, to, ac to accommodate that? Uh, we also found, finally, a failure to learn from some of the evidence and experience that we'd accrued in the past. And when we've got such a huge amount of evidence and experience accrued over the last 25 to 30 years, then actually we can be doing a lot to, to you know, we, we can't, you know, health, it, it, health, our health system is an incredibly complex system. It's a complex adaptive system. And there is no easy mechanical relationship between do this and that results. But we thought we could probably identify some best bets for investments in terms of policy levers. So some of these were around setting clear evidence-based national standards, which were done through with heavy clinical engagement and very strong national clinical leadership um, to create national service frameworks for some of the big killers like cancer, coronary heart disease, mental health, or around big users of, of, of health services like older people and, and children. Uh, we found use of targets and in inspection, when used in a focused way, um, w could also be very effective, which I was pleased about because I spent about three years of my career working on implementing national targets, so I was pleased to learn it hadn't all been in vain. Um, building the capability of the workforce, so investing in finding new, way, new roles, new ways of using people's skills and, and capabilities was also incredibly effective, as were improving decision support tools for, for people managing their own conditions 
and for professionals working locally. I think overall our, our, our picture was that, you know, that there had been a question raised of do we have the wrong system? Um, should we be looking to move, recommend a move to a different sort of system or a different sort of structure? And in the end we decided no because actually we don't need structures to do, make some of the shifts that we need to make. Um, it, it's about working with what we've got to realise the potential that is still fundamentally there. We can still, if our policymakers work collegiately uh, and in a mature way, they can still set national priorities. They can align them to the resources that are available. They can set clear national standards and expectations. We can collect the data that we need to drive some of this forward. And we can measure and report performance in a really powerful, impactful way. We just need to harness this potential more. So moving forward, our suggestion was we need better coordinated shared leadership by our national bodies. We need a reconstituted, rechartered national quality board. Um, in fact, many of, most of our recommendations were directed towards that group of people who had effectively gone on hiatus uh, towards the, the, in the last couple of years but are now starting to reassert themselves a bit more, hopefully emboldened by, by, by our work. Um, We'd gone from having a, 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 the, our first ever national definition of quality to having multiple definitions of quality, one through the regulatory framework, one through the commissioning framework, another through how providers were held to account for their performance. We recommended one, which again is something that's being moved towards. Um, we recommended having a shared understanding of how, how quality and costs are linked, not just overall in the abstract, but at much more granular service and condition and intervention levels, which is something that we're really try keen to try and progress and work on. Um, and we also talked about clarifying local accountabilities and making better use of the existing evidence base, which is something that we'll be continuing as we go through 2017. I think overall, and this is why we called our report a clear road ahead, um, we, we concluded that it it's, it's easy to criticise um, politicians and government for having short-term priorities and wanting to see something happen. But in a publicly funded health service, these are not only inevitable, they're also entirely legitimate. And the, the, our, you know, the, the English NHS needs to be responsive to these things. But that shouldn't be at a cost of investing in the longer ongoing track of building up capability and capacity for continually improving what we do. Um, you know, that shouldn't crowd out the, the short term either, but we need a balance of both. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the image that really struck, struck home was, you know, we're effectively running on a train, but we're laying the tracks as we go. We can't really see too far ahead into the future. Um, and we're just keeping our fingers crossed that we don't have a derailment anytime soon. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I think all the resources I've talked about are available on our website. Um, do, um, do engage with us. Um, do ask any questions. Um, thank you very much.